The spotlight has been on JWST for far too long. Let's talk about the next big thing in astronomy, the Euclid Space Telescope. This is an ESA mission set to launch no earlier than the 1st of July 2023 from Cape Canaveral in Florida in the US aboard one of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rockets. It will then travel through space for 30 days until it reaches its eventual orbital position, Lagrange Point 2, 150 million kilometers from Earth, just like JWST. However, unlike JWST, Euclid won't be available to the general astronomer population for anyone to apply to use it for their science. We actually just found out the successful proposals for JWST's second year of observations, and I made a video with my highlights if you want to check that out. I'll link it in the video description down below. Instead, Euclid is what's known as a survey telescope, and it's got one job. It will break up the sky into little postage stamps and slowly but surely image every single one to do a census on the positions, shapes, and distances to galaxies, these islands of billions of stars out there in the universe. It's going to do that for over a third of the entire sky. And the reason that it's only a third and not the entire sky is because some parts of the sky are actually blocked by all the dust and light from nearby stars in the flat disk of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. But then you also can't image the parts that are in that flat plane of the solar system that all the planets orbit in because there's a lot of dust and debris left over from the formation of the solar system. And all of that dust can also interfere with observations of objects in the background. You might have seen this phenomena of dust reflecting sunlight back yourself in a very dark sky. It's known as zodiacal light. You can see those two areas really clearly in this image. Essentially, Euclid will avoid this area and this area of sky, but image all of the rest. It's going to do that at a rate of 0.57 square degrees of the sky every hour, which is an equivalent area to three times the size of the full moon. And it will detect galaxies down to a faintness limit of 600 million trillion times fainter than the sun. Or to put it another way, a trillion times fainter than the Andromeda galaxy appears in the sky to us. Which means it'll be able to detect galaxies out to a distance of around about 10 billion light years away. For a much smaller patch of sky though, only about 53 square degrees, Euclid will observe for about 40 times longer, allowing it to detect more light and therefore or see fainter things out at greater distances. It might not seem like that big of a chunk of the sky that it's going to do that for, but if you take all of the observations that the Hubble Space Telescope has ever collected over the past, what, 33 years of its operations, it's still a bigger patch of sky than all of those added together. This is always the trade-off for these survey mission telescopes, right? Do you go wide and shallow or narrow and deep? So wide and shallow is a larger area of the sky, but each portion is observed for less time, so you only detect the faintest of things. Or do you go much narrower and observe only a smaller portion of the sky, but for much longer, that adds up to sort of the same amount of time it would take you to do that wide and shallow survey, so that you actually do detect the, the very faint objects. Euclid is going to do a mix of both of those things, and the aim there is to enable more science after all the data has been collected. Now, after launch, we're going to have about three months of commissioning and, and calibration on the telescope, checking everything's working okay. And then after that, the survey mission will start, and it's set to take around about six years. Depending on the performance of the telescope, and then also the fuel reserves that are left after launch, you could also get a mission extension after those six years are up as well. Maybe it'll do something completely different after that time. The data will then be released in chunks as the survey is ongoing, meaning that we should see the first data and results about two and a half years after launch. So what, that's like December 2025 for the first data release? So, you know, put it in your diary now, folks. <laughs> All this is being made possible thanks to a consortium of 1,200 people based in over 100 institutes across 16 countries. That's a lot of people speaking a lot of different languages, which brings me to Babbel, the sponsor of this week's video. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world with its intuitive lessons that help you learn a language through real life conversations that prepare you for your practical conversations in the office or for when you travel. 
I'm in a very privileged position that my first language, English, is the main language that scientists use to communicate their results. Like, I didn't have to learn a new language to pursue my career, but I know that's not true for everybody out there. Plus, since working in large international scientific collaborations, I've realised the importance of learning a second language. Babbel has made that so easy for me with lessons designed by real language teachers, and all I need is just 50 minutes a day to help build my confidence. J'ai écrit dans mon CV que j'étais sainte noix de karaté. <laughs> J'ai écrit dans mon CV que j'étais ceinture noire de karaté. <laughs> tu es folle ou quoi So to start learning a new language in just three weeks with Babbel, click on the link in the video description down below and you'll get 60% off your subscription. That includes their lifetime subscription as well. So thank you so much to Babbel for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to Euclid. So what data are we actually going to get from Euclid? Well, it observes in both visible and infrared light from 550 nanometers to two microns with a telescope mirror about 1.2 meters across. So just less than half the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's got both an imager called VIS that operates in visible light to give us optical images of galaxies and then an infrared camera and spectrograph NISP that splits the light through a prism into to the trace of how much light at each wavelength we receive. Now with all the images that Euclid is going to take, what you're going to get is sort of like a two-dimensional projected positions of all of the galaxies and then of course their shapes as well. But with the spectra that Euclid is going to take, you can actually look how much the light has been redshifted by the expansion of the universe, stretch to longer and longer wavelengths as space itself expands. Then you can work out, okay, well then how long has the light been traveling through the universe to get that stretched? And therefore how far away is the galaxy that I am looking at? With that, you then get this third dimension for the galaxy position, allowing astronomers to make a three-dimensional map of all of the galaxies that we can see out to a distance of 10 billion light years. Upon completion, it will be the most precise and detailed map of our universe that's ever been made, essentially doing for galaxies what the European Space Agency's Gaia mission is doing for stars in our own Milky Way. Other surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is actually the date of visual that I've been showing all this time as an example in the video, they've done something similar before, but not over such a large area. Sloan was the northern sky only and was done with a ground-based telescope, not a space-based telescope, so it was very limited in terms of what it could do. But the construction of this map is the reason why the Euclid Space Telescope was dubbed Euclid, after the Greek mathematician Euclid of Alexandria, who lived in around about 300 BC and is often referred to as the father of geometry. Geometry is the key thing here because making a map of where you find all of the galaxies in the universe is essentially making a map of where all the matter in the universe is, which in cosmology is intrinsically tied to the geometry of the universe. So it's a really nice fitting tribute. So what's the plan then? Once we've got all of this data and have constructed this map, what are astronomers planning to actually do with it? Well, Euclid has three main science goals. Let's start with my area of research, galaxy evolution. With this huge sample of galaxies, we can look at how the shapes and properties of galaxies change over 10 billion years of the universe's lifetime. Because light takes time to reach us, as we look at more and more distant galaxies, we're seeing them as they were billions of years ago. And so we can actually construct this picture of how galaxy shapes and properties have changed over 10 billion years of the universe's history. It'd be like looking at a, a huge crowd of people, right, at all different ages, and from that, figuring out, okay, how does a single person change and age throughout their lifetime? And how does that depend on lots of different external factors like the environment that they live in? It's the same for galaxies. And there's lots of unanswered questions in this field still about how galaxies even stop forming stars and if that's tied to their shape. And because Euclid is going to provide such a large sample, we're going to be able to do such with like population statistics on that. Plus, we'll even get good statistics for even the rarest types of galaxies. The second goal is making a second map, but this one of where all the dark matter is. Dark matter is matter that doesn't interact with light at all, and for some reason there's six times more of it than there is normal matter in the universe. 
And even though we can't see it necessarily, we can still tell that it's there from its influence on other things around it. There's a whole bucket load of observations that support its existence, and I've summarized those in a video before. If you want to check it out, I'll link it in the video description down below. Now, like all matter, dark matter bends space itself, giving the effect of gravity, meaning that any light traveling along that curved space gets its path interrupted and disturbed if there's any dark matter there. In the most extreme cases, background objects can get bent into huge arcs or rings by big galaxy clusters. That's something we call strong gravitational lensing. But in the least extreme case, which we call weak gravitational lensing, the shape of background galaxies is just elongated slightly due to them just skirting past other galaxies in this overall sponge-like structure of the universe. I can actually create the same effect with a stemmed wine glass and a candle. With perfect alignment, I can get arcs and even a ring. But if I align it so the glass just skims the edge of that candle, the shape of the candle is just elongated and changed slightly. You can then look for correlations in the shapes of these disturbances or distortions of galaxies for galaxies that are nearby each other on the sky, because you know they'll have taken similar paths through that structure of the universe. And with that, you can then make another map of where all the matter is. If you then compare that to where all the light is in the images you take, that allows you to take away that normal visible matter. And then you get left with a map of just dark matter. With that, you can then ask questions like, is dark matter distributed smoothly or very like clumpy? And that can then tell you sort of about the properties of whatever dark matter is. And that has knock on effects for how galaxies first form in the universe for where the dark matter comes together very easily or doesn't at all. And then finally, you can look at the clumpiness of all the matter, both normal and dark, to see if that's changed with time and also on different scales as well, with the aim being to probe how the expansion rate of the universe has changed with time too. Because if the expansion rate is a lot stronger, then you're going to have a lot less clumping of matter at that time. Remembering that light takes time to travel to us. So as we look at distant galaxies, we're seeing them as they were billions of years ago. So we can see, okay, how clumpy are they compared to how clumped are galaxies and all the matter today? And so then we can work out the different rates of expansion of the universe and see how that's changed with time. There's been a few studies that have looked at this before at just a single distance. And so we've got a rough idea, combining all of those, of the trend that the expansion rate has increased recently, that it's accelerated, and that it was decelerating between about 10 and 6 billion years ago. But again, since Euclid is going to observe such a large patch of sky, we're going to see so many more galaxies before over a huge range of distances. So essentially, we're going to be able to like fill in the gaps on this plot to be able to track the trend much more precisely. That'll give us a much better idea of what's going on in terms of the expansion of the universe and maybe even help us pinpoint what is actually driving the accelerated expansion of the universe, i.e. what is dark energy. This thing that seems to make up 70% of the universe's energy budget, but all we have for it is a name. And if all of those three different reasons wasn't enough for you, because Euclid is a survey of over a third of the entire sky, it's also going to detect things like solar system asteroids and supernovae and maybe even exoplanets as well, all of which will just be buried in all of the data so that when it's publicly released, astronomers are just going to have to start digging for it and see what they can find. And who knows? what they will find. There's going to be so many serendipitous discoveries that probably go hidden for a really long time as well, just because of the sheer size of the Euclid dataset. So that is why you should believe the hype for Euclid. All of those blue sky discoveries, sure, but also galaxy evolution and figuring out the properties of dark matter and maybe even what dark energy is. So while it won't go breaking distance records like JWST is doing, it will quite literally redraw the lines on the map of the universe. All right, let's try this again, shall we? My camera just flicked off at me just being like, uh, internal temperature too warm, allowed to cool. I'm like, yes, we're all warm in this room, camera, but some of us are soldiering on anyway. Each other whose light will have taken a familiar path, a familiar? familiar path, a similar path, not a familiar path. <laughs> Observe such a large patch of... There is a hair on me. Got it. Boop. 
Ooh, it's scared and very, very warm. I see what my camera was talking about. <gasps> It's that time of the year where I'm gonna have to really start like filming earlier or much, much later before this room has had a chance to like become a furnace. <laughs>